before we get started on this lesson, I, I just wanted to share an experience with you that we had on Friday night. Friday night, uh, Mindy and I were invited to the home of Lanny and Heidi Eels. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Okay, so Gene and Dan know them. Uh, yeah, they, David, of course, knows them. Um, Lanny and Heidi Eels are the parents of Ivan Eels. Ivan and Emily have been coming to our church, found our church online um, several months ago, a year ago, almost, and, uh, and began coming, and then father and mother of Ivan, Lanny and Heidi, uh, started coming a little while ago. They were in our, our newcomers class a couple weeks ago. We went to their home thinking that it was just going to be Mindy and I getting to know them. They live up in Beaver Creek, which is outside of Oregon City. Um, and we, uh, so we arrived and there was, the table was set for eight, which I thought, oh, there's other people coming. Well, the, the other people that showed up were, the uh, first, first couple was a, a, a pastor from New Life Church in uh, West Lynn. Have you guys seen that? It's a, it's a large church and you can drive by it, West Lynn. Um, good church, I've heard many good things about it. That was the church that Lanny and Heidi were going to after they got saved. Now they came out of a cult in Oregon City. And it's, a, it's that cult that you've heard about on the news that people have been arrested in jail because they don't believe in medical health, okay? So they've been, they've been prosecuted for, um, you know, not taking their children to the doctor or whatever, and kids have died and so forth. Anyway, that's part of their, their theology. Um, th this pastor and his wife, lovely, they're a few years older than Mindy and I, but he went to Biola, where I went, and also went to Denver Seminary, where I went, <laughs> and we had tons of things in common, tons of things. Mm -hmm. It was, it was marvelous. But, but here's what I wanted to share with you. The other couple shows up, Gary and Marie Shaw. They had come out of that cult. And um, they said, we know you. I said, R really? No, we've seen you on the uh, YouTube or whatever. That, the same with the pastor. They've been spying on us. And, and that's a good thing. Because they were trying to vet our church for Lanny and Heidi. That's, that's a pastoral responsibility. And he had even tried to call me and have a conversation about all of this. But they finally got us together because they wanted to do their due diligence, which is awesome. Anyway, Gary and Marie Shaw had, were one of the first to come out of that cult. They said, oh yeah, we know who you are. I said, how? David and Nicole Aitken. Their son is good friends with their son. In fact, their son is at their house right now. <laughs> right now. But I remembered back when Nicole had texted me and said, you're going to be having a couple coming to your church, Ivan and Emily Eels, and uh, they're coming this Sunday, and they're, they're coming from a cult. Would you look out for them? And we did. We paid special attention because of that text. To go. In fact, if you talk to Ivan, Mark Idol pursued him to his car, and, and Ivan wasn't very happy about that the first, first time. And then he got, then they became good friends. In fact, Ivan and Emily are there at the Idols tonight at their life group. It's a fabulous story, but here's what I'm saying. This is how the kingdom of God is supposed to work. This is how relationships develop, blossom, move. Uh, uh, Heidi and Lanny just moved into Fruitland, or they haven't moved yet. They just bought a house in Fruitland, four minutes away from the church, because of Emmanuel Bible Church. They want to be close here. They want to get involved. They want to go through the ELS program. Grant, he wants to go to Africa with us. And so does this other pastor, by the way, which is, an I've got to tell you about that because he's really interested in ELS International. 
So, all of that to say, this is, a, this is a testimony of how God does things through relationships to get people to where he wants them to be. It was a, such a time of encouragement. Anyway. Can I all right. add just a second to yeah. that? So another interesting part in that is that the house that the eels are buying is right next door to where our daughter and son-in-law used to live before they moved into their tiny house and oh whatever my. and then out with that. So they lived in a little pink house that was right oh my. And um, so, and they knew the couple that Heidi and Wendell, uh, or Heidi and Lanny yeah. are, bought, are buying from is Wendell and wow. Teresa. But anyway, who went to the Fruitland Church there. And um, Teresa and I just put together this week how interesting that God has moved them into that house because Teresa's friendly with another lady that lives just just north of them, the next house north, who also has just come out of a cult. Oh my the one God. that meets out here on 878. Street or something oh here in McClay. Wow. Know, at the, at, okay. At the yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So she and her husband were raised in that church, and just in the last you know, year, two oh years, they've come my. out of that church wow. and had, you know, we've tried to get them to come here, yeah. but this half, church is so big yeah. and they're really introverted. Yeah. So I wonder anyway. if they know that I I wonder. I wonder, because yeah. the Gawati, Michael and Yelena came out of that call. Oh, really? Yep, yep they sure did. So, so look at this. Just oh, yeah, it's, it's so amazing. So, it's really exciting to think about Heidi and her husband being so close to Andrea, because they really need the encouragement. Wow, that yeah. is so cool. Mm -hmm. Because Heidi and Lanny share their testimony freely, and it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, mm -hmm. it's really cool. All right. Well, you guys, we're, uh, as you can see, we're, we're talking about conflict resolution. And I don't think you guys have your notes here. There's just a one page, thank you, Scott. There's just a one, uh, it's both sides, but there's a one page note for you to be taking notes here. We're going to be looking at this subject tonight in two different ways. One is we're going to be looking at it from the perspective of individual, our personal responsibility to resolve conflict. But secondly, we're also going to look at it from the perspective. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. We're going to be looking at it from the perspective of spiritual leadership. And I don't care if you're a man or, or Jean, if you're a woman. It's, it's the responsibility of anybody who is in spiritual leadership to be committed to conflict resolution. I'm talking about constructive conflict resolution. I'm not just talking about confronting somebody and, and uh, you know, saying your piece and then leaving. I'm talking about constructive conflict resolution. I'll say more about that throughout our time this evening. But um, let me just introduce this by saying that this matter of living together in peace and harmony and unity is the longing of Jesus' heart. You guys remember the, uh, the, the prayer that Jesus prayed in John uh, 17. It's recorded in John 17. So Last Supper, Jesus is praying, and, and he's prayed the beginning of John 20, the first 19 verses, he's prayed for his disciples, very specific things for them. Verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That, that's you and me too. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There's, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm not, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this passage here, but he's going to repeat himself in just a moment here. But, but do, do you see that there's a oneness that's supposed to be like the oneness between Jesus and the Father? And that that oneness is supposed to express the reality of Jesus, the truthfulness of Jesus, the authenticity of Jesus. 
Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Listen, that oneness is made possible because we have Christ in us. And we are in Christ and in the Father. There's a union between us, the Father, the Son, but we also have Christ in us and who is the Holy Spirit, of course. And that's what enables us to be one. Look, I uh, am dealing right now with one of the worst, uh, the, the, uh, not the worst, uh, it, it's, it's one of the most heart-wrenching conflicts between two brothers, physical, I mean, they're, they're blood brothers. And I'm dealing with it right now, and, and, and it's been going on for years. So there's been walls that have been built, and, and hearts that have become hard, and all of that, and all of that. And, and, and yet, I will just tell you, as I was talking to, to one side yesterday, the husband and wife, uh, they, and I told them what Christ wanted, and what it would look like for them to actually be one. They just said, that, that, that's not possible. And I said, you're right. You could not do this. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't do it. You have to have God do this for you. you that's why you have the Holy Spirit, is to enable you to do the impossible things like this. And I will just tell you, there are some conflicts that are just as, that when they are resolved, are just as great a miracle as God healing the blind or healing the lame because there's so much hard-heartedness and bitterness. It's, it's, it's a miracle when God does it, but it is possible because we have Christ in us. All right? Look at this, that we may be able to love each other as He and the Father have loved us. That is... A divine love that's not natural human love, but that's what he wants from us. That our relationships with each other are characterized by peace and harmony. I am doing some theological reflection on the meaning of being one, even as the Father and Jesus are one. It's characterized by peace and harmony. That means there are no walls or barriers. There is no unresolved conflict. There is no lingering tension. There is no rivalry or jealousy or ill will. And there is no cliques or constituencies. There is no gossip. Or slander. We're going to talk about some of these things later on. This is what I've just uh, shared with you are evidences of living in the kind of oneness that Jesus desires, but that Jesus has made possible. And positionally, we are one in Christ. We already are one in Christ. That's where we stand in His sight relationally or experientially not so much and we're going to talk about that in just a moment here okay the unfortunate reality in the church is division and we've seen it over and over i talk about the proliferation of denominations i've asked you this i think before and nobody knows for certain because it the number probably changes every day but it's estimated that there are between 20 and 40,000 Protestant denominations and um, I will just say I, look I, for <laughs> um, I'm going to give you an opinion and you can disagree with me it won't bother me at all but but I think denominations 
denominationalism is an evidence of immaturity. It's not living as one, as God intended us to be one. I believe it's an, it's an expression of the same error that Paul combated in 1 Corinthians, where he said, you guys are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. You've got these constituencies, these groups, this, these cliques within the church who for whatever reason, whether it's you know, a personality preference or whether it's a teaching style or whether it's a doctrinal emphasis or something, they've divided amongst themselves and Paul says, quit it. That is an expression of immaturity. Look, when you stop and think about it, most denominations, maybe all, I, I don't, I've never done a, a, a comprehensive study. I'm not even sure it's possible on denominational. But think about this. And by the way, these men didn't intend to start a denomination. Luther, Calvin with Presbyterians, Reformed, um, Wesley with Methodism, um, you know, Jacob Menno with Met for the Mennonites. There's, there's many other kinds of... These, these men who were leading these movements or these maybe uh, even revivals here um, were just preaching the word and somehow people started saying, we, we want to be their disciples. We, we have the same thing today, even if you don't call it denominationalism. We have the same thing with people that we, uh, who are our homeboys on the internet or whatever. MacArthur. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's, you know, I, I, MacArthurites and, and uh, Sprawlites and all. I, I'm not saying these people are bad at all. I'm just saying there's that expression of that today. And that's... Uh, a form of division. I remember being at a um, at a uh, Legionnaire conference. You know what Legionnaire Ministries is? That's R.C. Sproul. Uh, and this was in Seattle several years ago. And there were several people from our church that had gone there. And, uh, and I was there. And I, I just remember one of the speakers, and I, I love the speakers, but one of them saying, you know, this is a sin that even us Reformed people get involved with. <laughs> I thought, do you hear what you're saying? You're, you're putting yourself already up here. Like, even us Reformed people can succumb to that. It's, it's subtle, but it's, it's, a, it's a view of, of not only ourselves, but it's a view of others. Somehow they're, they're here, we're here. All right. And then here's another issue, and that is there's a pattern of procrastination and postponement when it comes to conflict resolution for whatever reason. It could be laziness. A lot of times it's fear. Fear of what, by the way? Fear of what? Fear, fear of what? Being wrong? Being wrong? Okay, fear of being wrong, okay. Fear of rejection, fear of blowing up, and being, there's a risk that it might damage the relationship. What's that? Fear that maybe you'd have to live with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's all kinds of reasons why there is postponement and procrastination. Maybe it's just indifference, which is a lack of love, okay? But we tend to do that, and we come up with statements that sound convincing and reasonable, like, let's just let time heal this wound. You know, I think we'll all feel better when the temperature drops. And by the way, I'm not saying that's not true. But oftentimes when the temperature drops, it's just swept under the rug. And it's not dealt with. 
Con Let me just say something about conflict. If it's not resolved, it doesn't go away. Now, you might not think about it as much, and you might be able to live with it, but there's a wall that is erected between you and the other person that stays there. And by the way, the more you have conflict with that person and the more it's unresolved, I'm thinking of husband and wife, this happens a lot, the wall just keeps getting wider and taller because you add a brick every time. Yes? Um, what do you do if uh, you are the one seeking the peace of those that are with you? Uh, they're unwilling to receive the olive branch. Okay. Your wife was sitting in your chair on Tuesday and asked the exact same question. <laughs> At this exact same point in the lesson, something's going on in the class. <laughs> no. well, this, this, this was our life in yeah, no, the last yeah, years. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I was like, she asked me, yeah, no, we're right. actually going to get to that in just a few minutes. That's exactly what I told her. Are you going to them? Uh, you guys just call the, the office same, and set up an appointment, okay? We're in the same boat together at the same time. Yes. Yeah. We're, yeah. 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 we're going to get to that in just a moment because that is a very real possibility, and it happens all the time, and it happens in ministry all the time. Look, it happened this year, this past year, a ton in our church, where we made the initiative I'm going to say nine out of ten relationships, we took the initiative to try to restore and reconcile and so forth. And, um, and I'm going to say nine out of ten times it didn't work. Um, and, and so what do you do? I mean, we, it, that wasn't the only time we did it, but what do you do? Well, there's, there's instruction, I believe, in Scripture that addresses that very thing. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about a biblical foundation for conflict resolution. I have these verses up here, but if you want to look in your Bible and, and see them, that's, that's fine too. I want to talk about its priority and urgency. Remember, this is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23 and 24, he says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Can I just ask, what was Jesus saying there? What's he saying? Or is it so self-explanatory that we don't, we're, we're just, it's... But God would rather have you reconciled with your brother than leave the gift. Yeah, and, and, and think about this. The gift that, that they're offering was a high priority. It was a, an essential part of the Jewish life in the Jewish community. You go to the temple or you go to whatever place and you offer your gift at the altar. Why? For forgiveness, for you know whatever it is that the Lord is asking you to do for Him, you offer that gift. That's a priority, huge priority. This even takes precedence over that. This takes precedence. Yeah. Don't we have the same instruction for communion? Exactly. Exactly. I think there's a parallel thing when Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 11 with communion. That that's the priority. Particularly, think about this when you use those words, not discerning the body of Christ, you're drinking unworthy and eating and drinking unworthily. What he's talking about there is in not discerning the body of Christ, he's talking about his body of the church. Yes. And the unity. The unity that he... That he's given. Yes. It's, it's not uh, just, you're not realizing the body he gave. Yeah. But it's his body right now. Remember, in that context, in 1 Corinthians 11, there again, it is about division. 
That's the sin that he's primarily referring to there, where you drink and eat in an unworthy manner. It's that division. So there is a priority. Same, same thing. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I want to look at some New Testament admonitions, and this will answer your question, Grant. This is Romans 12. I'm just going to quote a portion of these verses here, um, at least verse 16. He, the admonition is to live in harmony with one another. And then he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. There are many admonitions in the New Testament to live at peace. Rome, uh, Hebrews 12, 14, which says, Pursue peace and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. There's other admonitions, but the reason I chose this one is because there is an understanding on the Apostle Paul's part, and certainly there was on Jesus' part by example, that it is it may not be possible to live at peace with everybody. He says, as far as it depends on you, you make the effort to do what you have to do to live at peace. You fulfill your side of the of, 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 of the thing. Even if you only have 10% of the blame. By the way, even if you have 0% of the blame. Because that's what Matthew 25, 23, and 24 said. If, if, somebody, if, if you remember somebody has something against you, you go. Relationships are that important. Now, uh, Grant, I, I, I often think about this. You know, Jesus, and I know you know this, but uh, Jesus did not live at peace with everybody. Even Judas, in the end. I mean, Jesus pursued peace. Jesus was gracious. Jesus was kind. He washed his feet the very night that he went out and betrayed him. But Jesus did not live at peace with everybody. Now, I, I know it's different because the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of them were not the people of God like he's talking about here in us pursuing peace and relation. Jesus did not, I mean, Jesus alienated them. And he didn't go out of his way to try to say, hey, just, hey you guys, why can't we just be friends? You know, let's, uh, he certainly did. But I would also just say, though, that there are times when we cannot live at peace because we're not responsible for the other person. They have to give an account to the Lord. The, I was telling you about the, um, the, the couple that I met with yesterday that are having this huge conflict with a relative. And the question that they kept asking was, well, <laughs> And, and they didn't even know that. I, mean, kept, I kept reminding them. They just, they, this is just a natural question, and they didn't even realize they were saying it. But it was always, well, what about him? <laughs> what about him? Well, what if he doesn't? Well, what if, you know, it was always about anticipating what he would or would not do. And I said, you've got to get that completely out of your mind. This is not dependent at all upon what he is going to do. This is only what God is asking you to do. And you can only do what he's asked you to do. And I'll tell you what, if you do that, you'll be free. doesn't mean the, rec the relationship will be reconciled. You'll be free to even love that person. Because you've let it go. You've forgiven. And I, I, I do think... Uh, that, that implicit in this whole idea of living in this way, even if the other person doesn't respond, means that we don't live with angst towards people. We've tried to reconcile, for example, they refuse, and so we hold it against them. No, no, no. I don't think that's what the Lord meant at all. We let it go. 
and live at peace. I gave this illustration in my in the women's class yesterday. I was so impressed with my wife, who's one of her sisters. She she comes from a family of six girls. One of them died 25 or so years ago. But about 20 years ago, uh, one of the sisters uh, got really angry. She's the only one that's not a believer, by the way. And she got angry at the other four living sisters. Mindy's the youngest. And Mindy bore the brunt of that hatred and rage. She told Mindy flat out, I wish you had died instead of our other sister. I wish you would burn in hell, literally. Um, and it, it was very hurtful. Um, it broke Mindy's heart. And by the way, I will just tell you, it's just a little side note, I, I think she focused on Mindy because Mindy was the brightest light. <laughs> she shone brightest for Jesus among the other people. And so it was, it was vented towards her primarily. But I will just tell you, for eight years, this sister refused to say a word to her. In fact, she said, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. Mindy would occasionally reach out. And every time she'd say, Stan, what do you think if I wrote this? I, and I was all, I, no, <laughs> no. She's going to, you know, because I, I wanted to protect her. I wanted to protect her from being hurt so bad. I'd seen how badly she was hurting. And, uh, but she kept it open. And finally, after eight years, there was reconciliation. Now, it's interesting to me that when that opportunity for reconciliation came, I was guarded. The other sisters were guarded. But Mindy was like, oh man! Yeah, and she completely embraced and reconciled. And I'm going to just tell you what, she didn't let her heart get hard. She had let go of the angst and said, my love for that person, my sister, who doesn't know Jesus, is greater than my hurt. And I just have so much respect. By the way, this, this lady is still not a Christian, but she wants to talk with Mindy and I about Jesus. She just wrote that a few weeks ago. Her and her husband both, they're Buddhists. They're, they're way out in the weeds somewhere. And I will just tell you, um, she has more admiration for Mindy than anybody. Uh, you should see the thing she writes to Mindy. I would just say that's the kind of way that God wants us to live toward those who don't reconcile with us. All right, let's move on. Maintaining the unity of the Spirit. Here again, this comes from Ephesians 4, where he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Here's that manner. With all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through. I don't know how you can read that and not think about denominations. I, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm just jaded. But I think this is the will of the Father maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And one of the things that we, unfortunately, can discover, um, and, and it's heartbreaking, is that the bond of peace that, that exists between people in churches sometimes proves to be very, very flimsy, very thin. It breaks quickly. And that's not at all the Lord's intent. That bond of peace is intended to be the Lord Jesus. 
For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All right. I have a question. Yes, please. So, a couple years ago, we had, we, we had the issue with um, candy food. Yes. Um, and we we put up the line and said, yeah. we need answers to this yeah. before we continue. I think that was done very respectfully, mm -hmm. very well. You know, I heard about it. But how does that fit in with what you're talking about? We're going to get to that. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to get to that because we're actually coming up to a place where we're going to be talking about what you do when there is sin that needs to be confronted and then what you do now I'll just tip my hand right now it's always for the purpose of getting back to that relationship of unity and peace that's the purpose for doing what you do it comes across sometimes as unloving my goodness I'm dealing with a situation right now where I mean this just breaks my heart where uh, I, a couple that I married, they don't need long longer go to our church, but I'm, I'm good friends with them. I met with the husband today, this afternoon, um, where she's left, her husband wants to get a divorce, and uh, they've got a four-year-old child. It, it, it's just heartbreaking. But here's the thing. Uh, there's absolutely no interest, no desire in having any kind of conversation with me. With me. And I'll just tell you why. Because she knows what I'll say. So I've reached out many times. I've, I've, I've asked to get together. I've tried to call, text, everything. Never, <clears throat> never hear anything back. And it's percolated into other family members who are now also avoiding me. That's the sad thing. We'll talk about what you do in a situation like that a little bit later, but those kinds of things happen often when people are hard-hearted because of sin. All right, that, that leads into this way. <laughs> Preserving a tender heart. This is at the end of... Ephesians 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I, 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 I sort of summarize this as preserving a tender heart. There's a lot more that could be said, but when I think of all of these things here, when you talk about bitterness, wrath, and anger, what is that? That's hard-heartedness. That's hard-heartedness. Clamor, slander, those are evidences, malice, evidences of a hard heart. You want to get somebody. You want to punish them. You want to hurt them. Kindness, forgiveness, those things are evidences of a tender heart toward somebody. And then... The eschatological reality, that's something Grant would say. The eschatological reality, I don't, this is not, this passage is not necessarily an admonition. It is a foundation and that is simply that when we get to heaven, we are going to be one. By the way, an amen belongs there. I mean, I hope you not only realize that, I hope you rejoice in that. You guys have heard people joke about this, and it's not going to be the Baptists over here, and the Lutherans over here, and the, this over here, and that. It, we're going to be people of every tribe, tongue, mixed together, and all of this, and getting to know each other, and living as one, and that is a beautiful, beautiful Oftentimes, and I, I'm, 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 I want to say something that, that uh, it, it just probably requires a little bit of thought on this, but oftentimes we have a tendency to look down on people who don't think the way that we think or do it the way that we do it. I'm talking about do church or do theology or think you know, and, and we think sometimes, well, 
I hope they get in, but I'm not even sure about them, you know. And, and I, I just have to tell you, when you think about us surrounding the throne of God and, and, and getting to learn of Him, I, I want to ask you this question. On a scale of 1 to 100, how well do you think we at Emmanuel Bible Church know the Lord? It might be 0.01%, maybe. I, I don't know. It could be less than that. <laughs> but I want you to think about that. Maybe we know the Lord at 0.01% and somebody else knows the Lord at 0.005%. But here's the Lord. And, and, and here's us co-strugglers in our theology. And we get to be there and God says, you guys, just wait till you're here a couple of million years, okay? And then you'll start to know me. You'll just start to know me. I mean, I just want you to think about that. that that's the reality. The reality is we're going to be one around the throne here. Yeah. All right. Stand. In, yes. You guys all know how I hate uh, to quote from the message, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, we do. But if I was writing the message, I would say this way. After this, I looked, and behold, a great integrated multitude. Wow. Uh, you know, that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, La salvación pertenece al Señor. Amen. Y, los, y quien está sentado en su trono y al cordero. And they'd be saying that in Spanish. I know they would. <laughs> <laughs> We'd all understand it. But yep. my point would be, you're not even going to have those denominations standing together again. No. You know, it's all of us with our attention focused on the Lord. Yeah. Not on, yep. not on Amen. Our Amen. Amen. Dan, we'd be happy for you to write a paraphrase. No, no, no. Okay. Well, There's not just, just thought I'd try. It. All right. Let's look. This is going to answer some of the questions that you asked Tony earlier. Let's look at some uh, particular things, some guiding principles about constructive conflict resolution. The, the first one is the principle of containment, okay? Now, we're gonna look at a passage that uh, has to do with sinning in a church. I wanna just give you a little bit of a context about that, okay? I want you to remember uh, when Jesus gave this admonition about resolving conflict and so forth, uh, this is one of only two times that the church is mentioned in the Gospels. The other's in Matthew 16. And, and, and secondly, the concept of the church as the gathered people, the, 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 the collection of, uh, uh, of, group of believers that meet together, that concept of a church was, was, um, was not so much uh, the people that gather in a building like we gather on Sunday mornings or some mega church, that kind of a thing. We're, we're talking about a, more of an intimate group, people that know each other, okay? People that have relationships with each other, which leads inevitably to conflict when you get close to each other, right? Inevitably, it leads to conflict. And by the way, I don't believe that conflict in and of itself is something that should be avoided. None of us like it, I don't think. But, but I, I do believe that what really matters about conflict is how you deal with it, how you resolve it or not. That's what's important to the Lord. But this principle of containment, uh, think about this. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, not Matthew 5, if... You remember that, that someone has, is holding something against you. Here, you're the offended one. 
Um, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, that's the first principle. And, 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 and if you want to say this is kind of a formula, that's okay. But it's a, it's a, it's a principle. Why would Jesus say, do it between you and your brother alone or you and your sister alone? Why? The only two parties that is affecting you. Okay. 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 Um, you are going to the person privately, trying to resolve it without getting anyone else involved. Let me ask you why? I think the first thing, it contains the damage. Okay? It preserves reputations. What happens when you are offended by something, somebody, and instead of going to that person, you go to somebody else and talk about it? What's the slant on it usually? Your side. It's your side, for sure. And it's rare, unfortunately, that the pers other person gets put in a good light. Usually it's in a bad light. I just wanted to uh, just give you guys this. Is, I didn't give this in the women's class, but I think it's good to give it to you guys. There was a guy that had his truck parked right next to a, an adult bookstore, or, you know, one of the bars or something where they have new dancing. And uh, he came out from right near there and got this truck. And somebody saw him from the church here. And of course, they wouldn't go to him themselves, even though I tried to get them to him. They came to me. But, uh, you know, they, they weren't brave enough to do that right. in front of him. So I went to him myself. And, uh, you know, that's, that was my responsibility once I knew about He really sinned against the Lord and brought disrepute right. dis to the church. Yeah. They were really on that. Yeah. If that person wouldn't go to him, then you have to. And I have to. If, I, if he came and talked to me about it. So I did. And the guy was, he was just stunned. Yeah, he goes there all the time. And it turns out there was a business right next door which he really came out of, and that's what he was, you know, sure he had his truck parked right there, but he wasn't in that in that business at all. He'd yeah. tell me exactly what the business was next door. And, yeah. You know, this person just assumed he yeah. was coming out there when he was on getting in his truck. Absolutely. And uh, once again, I was, I was, I went right to that person, yeah. and I said, "Here's what his explanation was, yeah. and here's what his work is. Yeah. He has to go to that location, and I believe it. Yeah. You know, don't go tell anybody else this. Next time, go to him yourself." Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, but it, it could have really hurt his reputation if that got squared around. The My track. goodness, yes, yeah, and that brings me to this point. It prevents the matter from unnecessarily escalating. Because there can be assumptions sometimes in a matter, even if you even if it's just a conversation between you some you and somebody and you interpret it some way that is like an offense, it 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 can if you go to somebody else, it can escalate quickly. Constructive conflict resolution between brothers and sisters in Christ demands that we be discreet. It requires confidentiality. And that is so important to the reputation of Christ. This is the, this is the result. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. In other words, you've, uh, you've mended the relationship, but you're now able to live as one in freedom. In freedom. Sorry. Here's the second step. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. What's the purpose of that? Yeah, okay, good. He said, she said. It's it's actually a 
place to get another objective take on what's really happened. But also, if there's been a real offense, it's also for these other people to apply pressure. So that there, I don't mean, you know, twist the knife in the wound. I don't, I don't mean stab him. In, I'm, just, I'm talking about apply pressure to see if there can be reconciliation. You know, uh, most of the time when there is a dispute between two people, even the one who's guilty doesn't want other people to get involved in it. Because there's an element of maybe embarrassment or shame or humiliation. But if there is other people that come and once again objectively plead with the person to reconcile, it can apply pressure. And that's also something that, um, that Jesus says, that's, that's the next step. That, that, that's, that hopefully it doesn't go further than that. On a, on a, I was thinking back on the first step. Uh, yes. Is it, a, is it appropriate to seek counsel from someone maybe removed before you go to the brother on how to seek to, counsel from on how to approach the person who's sitting against you? To seek counsel from whom? From, so, from, from, from someone else. So rather than yeah. just going and spread it, I saw Grant Park next to right. everybody I right. see. Right, 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 right. But if I was going to go to Grant, yeah. but maybe I was concerned, I, I can't think of a, a perfect example where I'd want to say, hey, how would you, how would you go about yeah. this conversation? Yeah. I, 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 I think it, it could be appropriate, sort of Scott. Curious. I think it could be appropriate if there's discretion <laughs> and confidentiality. In other words, I, I do have people say to me, quite often actually, what would you do if someone da 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 da, and they don't mention names, which I think is appropriate. Remember, containment is the right thing. If somebody did this, how would you deal with that? I've done something similar, just to reference the situation to someone else who's outside of it, because I've discovered more often than I'd like to admit, it's usually me misperceiving things, mm -hmm. and they're actually never less than that. That's so good. That is so true. That is so true. Now, let's get back to the fact that there is a real offense. I, I will just tell you that those two, one or two other people that you take with you ought to be mature people. They ought to be mature people. Uh, don't get somebody who gets emotionally, you know, distraught if, when they hear the story or whatever, or don't get somebody who can, you know, lash out. It's got to be mature people. You really have to get somebody that has the patience to listen to both sides, right. too. Not, right. not somebody you already know is going to take your side. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's part of maturity, you know, when you can objectively listen to something and try to try to resolve it that way. Okay, um, I'm going to give you an example of all this in just a little bit here. Um, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. Now, I, I, I'm going to give you an illustration. Before I give you an illustration, I'm, I'm going to define I, I hope I'm not taking too much liberty here, but, but define what, what church might mean in a particular situation like this. Because remember, we're talking here in the context of community living, where people are gathering together, they all know each other, there is relationships there. Stan, yes. you put it in the context of Rome, where you have the house church, yeah. you have the house the uh, church meeting in the house and so pastor and right right you know, so different. so 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 in that situation there and in most other cities when Paul would write a letter to the Romans or write to the Corinthians he was writing to actually several churches 
several house churches that comprised the church at Corinth or the church at Rome. So in that situation, you would bring it to the church. You're not going to bring it to all 17 house churches. You're going to bring it to the one house church where that person, where those two people are involved. And if they belong to two different house churches, you might bring it to both of them. But again, we're not talking about necessarily announcing something from the pulpit. We've done that before here, by the way. We're talking about gathering people who are part of that particular person's team, support group, a community. We, we've done that here on several occasions. One was with somebody, I won't even go over the sin, but it was a heinous sin. And it was, it was just terrible, it brought tremendous division. And when we went to the person, he didn't respond, took two others, didn't respond, brought it to the church. It was the group of people that were part of that person's community in the church. And there were, I don't know, Dan, two dozen maybe, a dozen, I'm not sure. But we didn't tell it to the church, you know, there's no point going to the we didn't tell to the congregation the retirement yeah. centers and telling the people that had no relation to this, right. this person. Right, right, <laughs> right. We didn't, we didn't spread it to the whole ministry. In, in, in another church. situation, there was a, 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 a woman who, I'm, I'm saying all these things because uh, none of you guys were here when some of these things happened. Jim was, but um, there was a woman who, um, a widow in our church, lovely, lovely person, who who started dating a, a, a married man, and they ended up having a relationship, and he divorced his wife, and they got, and I got in the middle of it, and we, and it, and it turned really heart wrenching, but the church that because she wouldn't listen to me, and I met with the the guy too, her boyfriend, because he was a professing Christian. Uh, when, the, when we gathered with the church, it was, a, um, it was a group of ladies that she was part of their Bible study. They, they loved each other deeply. And it was grievous to that whole group of ladies, by the way. Terribly grievous. But that was the church. And uh, anyway, so... All right, does that make sense? Any, any questions about that? Now, I, I want to just tell you, um, yes, Dan, go ahead. just wanted to say there's one caveat to that. Um, when an elder sins, um, the scriptures are a heck of a yeah. lot more harsh yeah, on That's him. right, that's right. And for instance, in the Church of Rome, the whole Roman church would have known about it. That's right, that's most correct. probably. Yeah. But it was a different purpose there. Yeah. And I think that's a, an important thing to, uh, to emphasize. I think that's good. That's really good. Let, let me just say, nobody likes to do this thing. Nobody likes to go through this process here. But, but can I emphasize that it is a process of love? It is a demonstration of love. I'm, I want to give you a story here. Um, Dan? Yes. You, I don't know if you're going to say this, but it's important to point out that even that last step when you tell it to the church, yes. the point is that the church would apply prayer That's to right. the person. That's right. We pray for him when the church is involved in this restoration. Right. It's, not, it's not with the goal of purging the church from some evildoer yeah. or somebody that's beneath us now. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, there was a, a deep, nobody would know, know who this person is, which is why I can tell this story. This was years ago, uh, 15, 15, 12, 15 years ago. Um, there was a, a, a dear lady in our church who I loved dearly. She was probably 81 years old um, at the time this happened. She came to prayer meeting she came to Sunday, we used to have Sunday night dinner, she'd come, she came to, 
And she, we would hug and she would say, oh, Stan, you're just like my son. You're just like my son. And I, I love this lady dearly. Sweet, sweet lady. She had a husband who was not a believer. And he was an odious man. <laughs> he, was, he was just mean, ornery, rude. Uh, he just, he, I just, it, it was so interesting. She was so sweet on the other end, and he was just the opposite. And, and yet, uh, those two married people as a couple would often do things with other couples in our church that were lovely people. Um, Grover and Gladys Welty, uh, Leonard and Sylvia Roth, they were all friends. They'd golf together, go out for dinner, all those kinds of things. Well, um, this lady who was so faithful and praying and all of that, um, one day I got a phone call from her husband. And he says, do you know where so-and-so is, my wife? I said, no, what happened? She says, well, I was at the dentist and I came home and she's gone and all of her stuff is gone. And so I was shocked. And again, we're talking an 81, he's 83, I think. Um, I started, I, you know, I started making phone calls, calling the friends that I knew she had and everything. And everybody was a little bit, <laughs> a little bit guarded a little bit protective of her, but I finally found out where she was. She'd moved into a retirement home down here without his knowledge, and she was planning on divorcing him. I said, I've got to come and talk to you. So I went, and I, I mean, in that conversation, there were tears, and it was hard. I brought my Bible, and I showed her what Scripture said about it. I pleaded with her. I said, you're you're getting pretty close to getting to ready to see Jesus here. You don't want to risk your, his displeasure with you after persevering. This wasn't their first marriage, but they'd been married 40 years. You don't want to risk, after making those vows, the displeasure of Jesus and violating your testimony and everything else. Okay, and, and, and she cried, and she says, Stan, you're right, and I'm sorry. And um, Anyway, I probably no sooner had gotten home than I get a phone call from one of her kids. What are you doing to my mom? Why'd you upset her so much? Stay away from her. She's no longer part of your church. <laughs> that kind of a thing. And I very gently said, look, you know, she is part of our church. I have a responsibility to do this, and I'm doing it because I love her. Come to find out, by the way, that it was her kids that emptied the apartment. They had, they had made this plan, and they put the plan in motion when they knew he was going to be gone a couple hours, and it was all of her kids that got involved and moved her. So they were all in cahoots over this. Well, I was surprised because it seemed like she had been soft. So I went back <laughs> soon thereafter. We had another talk that ended up in tears as well. Next time I get, a, I get home, I get a call from the son this time who really laid into me. By the way, these are all Christians, and professing Christians, I should say. Go, all go to church and churches in Salem. And by the way, it's not a reflection on their churches. This happens all the time with people. So it, it doesn't matter about their church. It, it matters about them. And anyway, he was just really upset. And stay out of my mom's business. And I said, look, we can't. She's... So, a little while later, I was busy doing something. We sent three of our elders to go talk to her. Dan was one of them. And the two others were Dan Detweiler and Tom Amon. Now, I don't know what you guys know about Dan Detweiler and Tom Amon, but if you don't know them, they're softies. They cry at the drop of a hat. They are so tender-hearted and loving, and they communicate that love. 
I wasn't there. Dan was was there. What what happened, Dan? Tom and, and Dan spent most of the time in tears as a chief, and I spent some time there too. Yeah. And uh, but just pleading with her to really follow the Lord in this, not not be listening to other voices. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't the repentance, there was a true repentance, for sure. So, get back to, uh, what, after this happened, I get another phone call from the son. This time, there are many expletives in the conversation. And, uh, you know, we're going to come after you, we're going to, you know, you, you have no right, and da-da-da, stay away, and we're going to put a restraining order or something, I forget. But, nevertheless, it was vehement anger towards us. Meanwhile, her husband, this odious man, started coming to church, started coming to prayer meeting, started hanging out at these Sunday night dinners. By the way, he would never shake hands with anybody. It was just kind of his, I don't know why, maybe he had a phobia, but he would never shake hands. He was embracing, I mean, let me just tell you, something was going on in this man's life, and I was meeting with him regularly until he gave his life to Christ. By the way, I baptized him at the age of 85. Let me just say that when I would talk to his wife about it or any of the children about it, what do you suppose they said? What? They didn't believe it, no. They didn't believe it. What was he doing, they said? He's manipulating you. He's trying to change your mind about her and trying to make an alliance with you and everything. They didn't think it was authentic at all. By the way, I wondered at first. I, I sure did. But nevertheless, we continued. This went on for 13 months. This man had been, prior to knowing Christ, he had been the stingiest man I know. During those 13 months, they racked up forty to $50,000 of legal fees with lawyers because of the kids getting involved in you know, all of this. So forty dollars to $50,000 of legal fees. And whenever he told me about it, there was never any kind of bitterness or animosity towards his wife. It was, it was truly astounding to me. That, that may have been the best evidence of true regeneration of anything. But nevertheless, he kept wanting to be restored. Thirteen months after she left him, I get a call in my office one afternoon. It's the woman in tears. Stan, I'm so miserable. I'm so miserable. I said, very gently and lovingly, you know what to do. That's all I said, you know what to do. I get a phone call the next day, it's the man who says, Stan, guess what? And then she's on the phone. They, they're both on the phone together with me and they sound like giddy teenagers in love. I am dead serious. That was authentic. It went on. We used to double date with those guys, Mindy and I. There, and he would always insist on driving. He's 86 years old. Drove us up to the Moda Center one time to see a concert. Guy playing a violin. Um, it was amazing. We did a vow. We, they repeated their vows in my office with some of their kids on both sides in the office. It was, it was truly a miracle. And when he died, they were just as committed 
to one another as ever. She, she just died this year, probably six months ago. All I'm saying is in that it's an illustration of the heart-wrenching process of going through this and even thinking this is not, this is just not working. But seeing God at work doing His thing because He is committed to this kind of restoration and reconciliation. Dan. Um. And I, I want to get back to this, tell it to the church. Yes. Here. Uh, one, one thing I think is important, guys, that, that realize is that we do have a responsibility to the greater body of Christ, particularly if we're shepherding. And I would be really careful about doing this as an individual. But, for instance, we had a man that was under church discipline and would not... Uh, his real sin at that point was not submitting to the authority uh, of the government, really, or of the uh, elders in the, in the church here. And he was under church discipline because of that, not because of some Another people. more obvious sin. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But uh, he actually would say that it was God's calling to him to the authority that God has placed over him in both those cases. And um, he found it more convenient to start going to another church. And that was a case, for instance, where I went to that other church and I talked to the pastor of the church. I didn't give him all the information. I said, uh, there's some court documents you can, you can research if you want to, and you, it will give you a context for why he doesn't want to submit here to our church. Uh, but this man, we love him, we care about him, we love his family. You know, we, we'd uh, been ministering to his family in his absence for a number of years even. And we, we still care about it. But uh, we just told his pastor, this man needs an intensive shepherd. And his family does too. Because he's, he's not able to give them the leadership, the you know, certain leadership they need. And uh, so asking the pastor to get the story himself and, and uh, you know, get clarity on what was going on, but giving him enough that that he had a basis for understanding the urgency of the shepherding. You know, then I could leave it with him. And uh, that's so, the due diligence that is necessary. Well, we have to give account yeah. to God for their souls. You know, I want to see him continue to be shepherd. That worked out well with that pastor with that church. There was another case where there was uh, some sin uh, it resulted in a divorce and, and a remarriage and, and the couple that was remarried and, and you know it wasn't uh, actually it, it were living in sin and wouldn't uh, they wouldn't repent at all they chose also to walk away from the congregation here and I went to that uh, the pastor of the church where they started attending and seemed to be in good uh, good standing there and just tried to talk to him for a minute he just walked away from me. He wouldn't even talk to me. But I wasn't dumping on him or anything like that but he wasn't interested in dealing with problems. And uh, there's not much you can do about that. <coughs> no. The, but the least, Lord will hold him accountable. Right. The Lord is going to hold yeah. us accountable after that and no one more here. Yeah. Any questions about this whole idea of Matthew 18 and, and the principle of containment? All right. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the principle of immediacy. Uh, I'm just going to give you one reference. There's, there's a lot that we could talk about here, but... Certainly what Jesus said about leaving your gift at the altar in Matthew 5 is immediacy. 
Here's another one. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. By the way, that's all one sentence. It's two verses, but it's one sentence. When it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, you guys know, essentially, that just means take care of it today. Don't go to bed with unresolved conflict. Deal with it immediately. And I am convinced that not dealing with anger immediately like that, the reason why it says in verse 27, the same verse, same sentence, give, give no opportunity to the devil. I like NIV that says, do not give the devil a foothold, is because the enemy gets the opportunity then to exploit that vulnerability of ours. What is that vulnerability? Well, it's a heart that is not right with another person that can turn into a hard heart. It's a vulnerability to believe lies. He's the father of lies. By the way, when you don't resolve conflict with somebody, I'll just give you an illustration with me and my wife. I, when, when we are getting along, and we do get along most of the time, um, I can tell you 20 things like that that I like about her, and I'm hard-pressed to mention two that I don't. When we're in the midst of a conflict that we haven't resolved, I can, it's just the opposite. I can tell you 20 things I don't like about her. And I'm hard-pressed to mention two that I do. Well, what's happened? She hasn't changed. My heart has changed. And those lies, I'm not saying those 20 things I don't like are even true. They might just be exaggerations or things that, that I'm, you know, just saying off the top of my head because I'm mad at her. The point is, we're vulnerable to believing those lies. And the longer it goes on, the harder our hearts become. That's why immediacy is so important. And I want to just say, you guys, it is incredibly important as leaders to practice immediacy in this. I, I will just say, um, I, I, forgive me, I'm going to, I, I don't think it's wrong to use this, as a, but the situation that we were dealing with last year, or a couple years ago at Canyon View, Jim was not involved in the equation at all. But let me just say, it was because they didn't practice immediacy that it had escalated to a point where it got out of control and we had to get involved. It was because the the, the group, the board there, did, had not practiced immediacy. And if that happens in a church, it's really difficult. Well, it affected testimony in the greater church. Oh, my goodness. It still affects. I got an email this week. Should I send my kids to Canyon View? I mean, it's still, people wonder. By the way, it's been completely resolved. I mean, completely and beautifully. And I'll, maybe we'll have a chance to tell because Dan and I were involved in that restoration. But, but nevertheless, it was a hard thing. I, um, oh, what was I going to say? Hmm. Well, it may come back to me. Maybe it wasn't that important. Okay. Let me talk about some practical suggestions for success. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I think this is just good for you to know. Uh, a week ago, a week and a half ago, on a Monday night, we had an elders meeting that was, for lack of a better term, it was just a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And it was all about the COVID guidelines and all the stuff that's been happening in the last year and a half. And it was a difficult conversation. I, it, it, I think it was a constructive dialogue. I think it was 
uh, really profitable. It was necessary that we do it, but it was difficult and it wasn't resolved that night. I was facilitating. I, I, I hardly ever uh, am involved in facilitating a conversation like that. I, I'm one of the elders. I, but I, because of the other people that were involved, I volunteered to facilitate the conversation. And um, it, uh, it, we left that meeting, I think everybody left, heavy-hearted. <laughs> And uh, I didn't get much sleep last night. I know many others didn't either. I know it was, it was hard. But I will just tell you, this is, this is the beauty of a commitment to conflict resolution and practicing immediacy. Within 36 hours, it was completely resolved. I'm talking about where there was not, not just changes of heart which led to humility and repentance, but asking for forgiveness and all of these other kinds of things. And, and, and I'm not talking about it was an argument. It wasn't a knockdown drag out meeting at all. I'm just saying attitudes had been building and so forth. And it was a thing of beauty to see that. By the way, what the enemy intended for evil, God turned and used for good. And that's his intention always, even in a situation that doesn't necessarily go as well as we hoped. But that's an example of doing that. I honestly don't know what we would have done had it not been resolved, I think we would have, have, I think we would have had to meet again, we would have had to somehow communicate with each other. As it was, there were, I don't know, Grant, there were dozens of emails <laughs> that went out from the, from the board members to one another over the next few days, but that also resulted in us coming together, I think it was a... Um, did I read something this last Sunday, or was it the Sunday before? Last Sunday. Okay, I read something last Sunday, yeah. That was what resulted in that, was that what I read, and then about Brad's sabbatical, uh, or his time off here. And, and, and that was something that came together as a result of the unity that, that came out of that. And that's, that's all to, to God's <coughs> praise and glory. There. All right, let's talk about practical suggestions for successful in resolving conflict. Uh, first of all, prayerfully prepare before you go into a situation. I'm talking about before you either go to a person one-on-one -on -one or before you take one or two others with you or anything. Prayerfully prepare for this. And I've got several suggestions. Ask the Lord to incinerate your pride, presumption, assumptions, opinions, judgments, all the things that are not of Him. Ask God to just burn those things up. I, I, I believe that's a prayer according to His will. And, and He'll do it if we're sincere. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I believe that without the Spirit involved in these things, that we're, we're pretty much spinning our wheels. Uh, that's in order to display wisdom, also the fruit of the Spirit. Ask God to preside over your emotions, thoughts, attitudes. You guys know. And by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with shedding tears when there's conflict and there's conversation and discussion about it. I, I don't, I, I think that's perfectly appropriate at times. But we need to ask the Lord to keep us from getting unnecessarily heated up or angry or something like that. That's part of our flesh. In other words, um, this goes back to the first thing. There, there shouldn't be any of our flesh involved in conflict resolution. And pray. 
for the other person. You guys know this. Prayer changes your mind about that person because this is what God wants you to, because you begin to see that person from God's perspective. You realize, wow, the Lord purchased him with his blood just like he purchased me. The Lord loves him just as much as he loves me. There's all kinds of things that that can do. Secondly, clothe yourselves with humility. Can I ask you, just think about this, why is humility essential to genuine conflict resolution? Because if you have pride, you will be opposed by God. That's right. <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> You'll be a pride. Uh, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if, number one, if you've got pride, you're, you're already yeah. on, on the wrong side. You're already on the wrong side. It's interesting because there's so many. There's such good fellowship among sinners. You know, uh, drunkenness, for instance. Yeah. That's a great time to bar. Yeah. You don't have that among proud people. There's no, no fellowship. It's there's no fellowship. It's competitive. And that's the last thing you want around conflict resolution. That's right. Yeah. By the way, you know that you're clothed in humility when you no longer care about being right or winning the dispute or making the other person feel bad or having the other person punished or pay for what he or she has done to you. That's, that's real humility. Pastor Stan? Yes, please. Sometimes, personally, um, having, having God ruling my emotions does not lend to being resolved immediately. So where do you find the balance there? Okay. Say that again. It doesn't lend itself to what? To resolving it immediately. Yes. Sometimes it takes time. Yes. Before I'm humble. Yep. Or, That's a or great a point. Or a good attitude towards the other person. That is a great point, Colin. Because I can give an illustration of something that happened three or four weeks ago. I told this to the women in Els then. I went into a conflict resolution supposedly prayed up. I even led the conflict, this is me and the conflict, so I even led the, the thing with a prayer, <laughs> and my pride was enormous. It, it was exposed early on in the conflict. Now, I just have to tell you, if I was, if I, I learned a lot from that, but if I was to do it again, I would probably have learned that that, that I still carried angst into that uh, conversation, I mean, into that introduction. That I, I probably learned that as long as I have the desire to really tell the person what I think, or give the person a piece of my mind or whatever, um, then it's not appropriate and I should wait. The, the Lord used my terrible blunder there and my even my he, he used it to expose something in me that was so ugly that I was so humiliated and ashamed and embarrassed that it actually resulted in my repentance uh, to the to the persons and it was it was it was actually a lovely thing it wasn't fun for me at all it wasn't and I'm still uh, stinging over it, but I'm so glad it happened because of that. But I would say, you're right, there are times when it takes a little while for us to allow the Lord to preside over our emotions and, and to, to, to get rid of our pride. Yes, Dan? But uh, I, I still believe that the principle of immediacy shouldn't wait until you think you're humble enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm consistently amazed at how God brings re resolution and I reflect back and I see pride all over me. Okay. 
God still brings resolution yeah. in His goodness. Yeah, in His goodness and His grace. Yeah. Salvation is not something I can, you know, become humble enough <laughs> that I'm worthy of. That's true. And so forgiveness is, you know, it's a messy thing. Boy, I'll tell you what, it is messy. But uh, that's a great point, man. I'm humble now, so I can do it. Wait a second. What did you say? I'm humble. I came to you humbly. <laughs> yeah, no. Forgiveness is a messy thing. You're, you're right. And, and, and sometimes that mess reveals something that the Lord wants to teach us that's, yeah. that's even bigger. All right. Communicate constructively. I would just say this. Avoid harsh tones. Accusator- accusatory words. Those are words that usually begin with the word you. You, 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 you. Uh, Inflammatory statements like, I can't believe you would do this. Exaggeration. You always, da 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 da. Facial expressions that show disgust or disdain. In, in that conversation I was just telling you about that I that I blew so badly, I was was sitting across from people and I was going like this. <laughs> now, you saw it, but I was thinking, I was doing it so slightly, nobody could see this. But this is how I feel. They saw it, believe me. Why are you shaking your head? That did not lend itself to resolution at all. Those kinds of things are, are they prohibit. Yeah. Gently and matter-of-factly reveal the perceived offense and how it made you feel. You know, you guys, I, I know that we're men and that we don't typically talk about our feelings, but I'm, I'm just going to tell you, we're talking about maturity now. We're not talking about being macho or being, you know, the guy that's supposed to be in control of his emotions. We're talking about maturity, which means authenticity. So I think it's very appropriate for us to say something like, when you did or said this, I felt such and such. I felt disrespected. I, I felt um, that you were, whatever. We, we, we identify what it is that we felt. Or, I don't know if you were aware of this, but when you did or said such and such, it made me feel that. Again, I'm not trying to give you a formula here. I'm just trying to say it's, it's, it's a way to diffuse the, if, if you start out a statement by saying, you know what, you said this, you did this, and that just ticked me off. Um, that, that's, that's a way to escalate the conflict. But, but again, even asking questions is a good thing. I'm going to, that's going to, be our next thing here. Listen carefully and objectively. Um, listening is an expression of love. Listening well is an expression of extreme love. Not listening is an expression of the opposite of love. I'll just say that. But so often when we are in conflicts and the other person is talking, what are we doing? We're thinking about what we're going to say. We're thinking about what we're going to say. We're formulating our comeback and trying to make sure that we can top whatever they have said. And, and that is just not, that's not constructive. It's not loving. Being able to even, after that person has spoken, before you say anything, because you've listened so well, you say, you know, I think what I just heard you say was da 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 
and let them say yes or no. Let them respond. It, I mean, you want them to know that you have listened to their satisfaction and you get what they're saying to their satisfaction. Now, I, I realize that's easier said than done. It's a skill, I believe, that we learn through practice, but it's also a, a, a way of being patient. It's a fruit of the Spirit, of being gentle. Fruit of the Spirit. Can I speak to that? Yes, please. Um, on listening, I think that, and in this case, it's probably a lot of people do. Uh, you can practice this a lot easier in a non confrontational thing. Yes. So that it's almost a habit. That's right. Versus thinking you're going to get in a fist fight and be able to keep your cool. Also. Right. You don't right. keep your cool when you're not in a fist right. fight. You don't think, I mean, like. That's right. Like. That's right. No, that's a very good point. I'm going to just say, that's a great point. We ought to be listening carefully and objectively all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time. All the time. And so we're able then, that just becomes a pattern, that when we hear somebody say something, we're able to actually articulate what they said, repeat back to them, restate it. Seek reconciliation if at all possible. Seek reconciliation. By the way, forgiveness is the funeral of the offense. Forgiveness is the funeral. Stan, yes. I, I don't know if I've said it here in the men's, I think I have in the women's, but Amy Carmichael, once again, missionary to India, was asked one time by somebody if she remembered an offense against her. And she says, no, I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> but that's forgiveness. That's good. That is forgiveness. And by the way, do you know how you know that you've forgiven? How do you know that you've really forgiven? You don't dwell on it. You, you don't dwell on it. You rest. You rest. You're free. Yeah. You're free. Here's, here's one thing. You're so free that you said, Lord, you do whatever you want to with that person. If you want to bless that person, you go ahead. If you want to punish that person, that's up to you. But I'm, try, I, I'm, just, I'm okay with whatever you do, Lord. That's, that's forgiveness. Does that mean that the prior 69 offenses don't, don't get bring their pain along with them when the 70th event occurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I, I personally, even though I, it may have taken some time, and I think I forgive them, when that offense happens again, yeah. I, I remember all those times. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There's, that's, that's a good point. I hope we all, all of you heard that. There are definitely things that can trigger the remembering of the offense. And, and I will just tell you, that can happen oftentimes when the offenses are really big and, and, and consequential and have brought an enormous amount of pain to somebody. And then it happens again and it's like, wait, I forgave, I, but now it's all coming back. And, and I, I, I'm just gonna say, that is a process that requires God's grace, God's provision, God's mercy. I mean, he's the only one that can allow us to do that. Because he did it. He did it. Stan, could I take a few minutes here and just uh, share a little bit about that canyon view thing? Yes, please. Right yeah. yeah, that'd be great. If I could share that just yeah. as a practical thing That's where a great you could see where we were going through this, the canyon view. I want to say that the, the board here, I believe, took the right action. Uh, I appreciated the fact that, you know, it wasn't an individual or anything like that, but we did try to practice containment uh, as a board. I wasn't involved in it personally, but I believe the board did the right thing. I think they were right to confront the lack of, of action by the Canyon View Board. Uh, I believe that uh, in time, the Canyon View Board did 
react rightly. Mm -hmm. There was actually a belief on the part of the board, probably a recognition, as I understood it, that there that would have been good to act a little sooner. Uh, you know, there was, in every way you could say there was sin there, there was repentance. So I yeah. Don't see. yeah, yeah. Okay. We still weren't reconciled. Right. And so I know that. Um, how how how, been, how would you for a few months, explain why you would say we still weren't reconciled? What what was the evidence of that? Well, we still weren't contributing to canon okay. too, and it seemed like they had something against us. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't. I wasn't involved enough. You know, I was not on the church elder board here, though I was one of the elders. But I was concerned about it because I care about canon view enough that I didn't want to just leave things the way it was. And so I've talked to uh, several of our, of our elders on the board and uh, was encouraged to go ahead and, and try to deal with the canyon. And so I'll guarantee you I was praying. Yeah. You know, and I know the board was praying. And I'm sure Jim was praying. And I don't know who all else. But I wanted to see full restoration of fellowship. And so, uh, you know, I asked, I asked God for wisdom. I asked God for that fruit of the Spirit in any of us that would go and, and talk with the uh, representatives of Canyon View. Uh, asked God to clothe us in humility and to help us to communicate in a constructive way. Be able to listen, seek reconciliation and forgiveness, you know, and just keep pursuing that until the Lord actually did something, you know, in, that, in our relationship. And it was really neat. Uh, I, I wasn't involved personally, so it was pretty easy for me to go and say, well, guys, I don't even know what the score is here. <laughs> but I know one thing, we're not getting along well. And we need to. We're part of the body of Christ together. We're one in Christ, in fact. And for the sake of the testimony of the Lord here and our witness for Him, you know, the way people are going to tell that is if we're walking in unity. And so that was really important. But the Lord just, uh, and it was interesting because I, I never used this passage. In fact, I don't even think I've even spoken on it before. But it was just uh, there in Galatians where uh, Pete Paul. Uh, has Peter come to Antioch, a Gentile church, and Peter get along famously with the people there at Antioch until some Jews can't come around. And then he kind of, you know, becomes a Jew again. And Paul just hits him right between the, I mean, he hits him right in the forehead, you know, with his hypocrisy. Right in front of everybody. And, uh, you can say, well, you know, I could, I could argue for Paul, but why didn't he at least go to Peter by himself? <laughs> you know, Matthew 18 stuff. <laughs> and so I can argue both sides, either Paul's or Peter's point of view. But the main thing is, in the end, Peter is able to say, you know, our beloved brother Paul, he's hard to understand. <laughs> you know, like some of the rest of the scriptures. But you see that love and that that respect in the end so they got it worked out and I, I just told the board of the representatives there, there's a bunch of the staff actually that met with us I don't really know what went on here I don't know who was right or wrong in the way things were even done you know I can't judge them but I know we've got to walk together and it was interesting as we talked to them uh, some of the assumptions that they had made. Well, I was and, there. I was there with Dan. Yeah. And so but they it, had they had actually made assumptions about some of the things we had said to some individuals that had been involved, and 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 had made some assumptions about our church, especially. Well, their that, church was actually spreading uh, right. disinformation right. or bad information right. or something to other churches, right. trying to right. come down on them. Right. It was all false assumptions, yeah. It was false assumptions that they had, but I don't know that we had, you 
you know, all, all knowledge either. Right. But it's coming in humility and saying, you know, guys, we got to get together here. We want to work with you guys. We love you guys. We don't know what's gone wrong exactly, but may the Lord help put us back together for we can work together. That's you know, that's, that's God's heart. It was an interesting time because Dan and I kind of had a talk of Dan was saying, saying, why isn't the EBC board pursuing the whole reconciliation? And I'm saying, well, Kenji hasn't done anything either. They haven't pursued it either. And so I went and kind of felt that as Dan was going over here, I was going back to the Kenyan view and saying, okay. you guys, what do you guys think? And wow. they had a lot of... yeah. Since you had a containment in the board, it wasn't filtering down to the rest of the staff. So the rest of the staff was going, it's none of their business. Yeah. And it was their business. Yeah. And so I was able to fill in yeah. those gaps. Yeah. And when you got to that final meeting, then uh, yeah. Well God used it. It was a beautiful thing. You know, behind the scenes yeah. we didn't even know about. Yeah, yeah. it was beautiful. But it was it was evident that when you have God involved in this, he can yeah. bring reconciliation. Right. And, and that's what he wants. Reconciliation yeah. then. I just got uh, somebody greeted me, I forget it was Lowe's or somewhere, that get the canyon view. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're I'm the guy that talked about people. Peter and Paul. <laughs> What's that? He said to you, you're the guy that talked about Peter and Paul. Yeah. That was a great emotion, by the way. All right. Thank you, Dan. Let's, let's move on quickly. We just have a couple of other things here. Uh, one is, uh, don't give up if at first you don't succeed. <laughs> um, doesn't mean that you're you're finished. Um, you can still keep pursuing that, and you, sometimes you just—I mean—you have to really trust the Lord to open the door. There just a couple of quick points here. I want to talk about this in relationship to the leader. I, I, I want to say that maturity. They're talking about the spiritual leader is measured not by what you know not by your skills or gifts, not even by your faith. Where did I just get that? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. It's measured by your love. By your love. Okay? And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about here. I, I'm just going to make this statement here. Constructive conflict resolution is quite possibly the greatest expression of love. Maybe giving your life for somebody, but constructive conflict resolution, because it's so hard. It's so awkward. It's so unpleasant. But it is an expression of love. Dan, on that slide you have the Ephesians reference. It's oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. You noticed. I love that. Okay, leaders must not be quarrelsome. And I, I uh, just quoted some of these passages. This first one is in the midst of the qualifications for elder in 1 Timothy 3, where it says an, elder, an overseer must not be quarrelsome. Um, and, but the second part of here, again, talks about not being quarrelsome, not breeding quarrels, um, but gentle, all of these kinds of things. Let me just say this, uh, that is, being a combative or a quarrelsome person or living with unresolved conflict disqualifies a person from being a spiritual leader. Now I'm gonna just say, i put a little note. I'm gonna say there may be unresolved conflict, but at least you tried to resolve it. That, I should say that. Because remember, we can't resolve everything necessarily, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace. So that's what I'm gonna say. Okay, any questions about anything here? Yes. Just two references I'd like to give. Yep. Proverbs seventeen fourteen. Oh, good, Dan. Yeah, bring that up. I'm trying to think what, what, what it says. 